Welcome back to TCM Celebration of Black History Month. I am delighted to be here with Dr. Lonnie Bunch, Secretary of the Smithsonian Institution. Welcome, Lonnie. I'm so glad to be with you. This is so much fun talking with you about movies and so insightful. And we're looking at films about black athletes tonight. The next film is a drama, Cornbread Earl and Me from 1975. And this is a film about a young man who is the sort of hope of the neighborhood, not unlike we saw in Hoop Dreams just a moment ago. And there's a tragedy that occurs that really exposes some of the social issues that this community faces. Let's talk a bit about 1975, because this is a moment in black filmmaking that's quite significant. We often describe the 70s as the black exploitation era, Shaft and Superfly, Foxy Brown. Anything with Pam Greer. But this is a different kind of film. Well, I think that's right. You have these movies that are urban, right, that really tell you about what life was like in the city. Then you have other films that really allow us to understand a complexity of family relationships, of hopes and aspirations and dreams. And this is a film that really talks about a family's hopes, about an individual's desire to be the best he can be, and then the reality of living in an urban environment and what happens there. So what you really have is not just films that are exploitation. You have films that try to explain, mm. that try to help us understand what black life was like, what were the possibilities, what were the pitfalls, of being black in the mid 1970s. Yes, I mean, I would put this film in the category of films like Claudine or Sounder or Cooley High that Cooley. came out the same year, 1975, and has a lot of similarities to this film. I mean, I think those films are films that are really helping the audiences understand that there's a diversity of black experiences, helping audiences understand that as much as we loved Shaft and Superfly, that that really wasn't close to the reality of what most black people existed. And so films like Claudine and Cooley High really do that. And so you see this interesting tension because it's really a desire to use film to illuminate the dark corners of the African-American experience. Some of those are negative, some of those are positive, And this film really has um, traits of both. Mm, yes, yes. And the casting of this film is quite remarkable. We have Rosalind Cash, we have the great Bernie Casey, we have Jamal Wilkes, who's billed here as Keith Wilkes, who was a UCLA All-American Rookie of the Year when he joined the NBA, playing a basketball player. So that kind of reality meets fiction there, I think gives this film a particular kind of authenticity. The cast is amazing. Madge Sinclair is in the cast. And what you have is some of the best actors who didn't get the big films, but who really bring together this sense of what life was like on that block, what families were like. And that in essence, it really does give you an understanding of what happens when someone hopes and works hard and plays basketball. And then when tragedy occurs, what happens? An important member of this cast, of course, is Lawrence Fishburne in his very first film role. Would love to hear some of your reflections on his performance here. He was really good in this film. <laughs> I have to be honest. I thought to myself, his role is just wonderful. Open, youthful, grappling with the challenges of growing up and grappling with making those hard choices um, of being a man, to use his phrase. And so in some ways, this really gave us hope and anticipated the career that he was gonna have. My goodness, from Apocalypse Now, not that long after this one, through the Matrix films, I mean, what a remarkable career and what a joy it is to see him in his very first film role. Especially because, remember, it's the mid 70s and you're really only talking about a few actors, a Sidney Poitier, a Harry Belafonte, whose film career goes through more than a few years. Um, and so to see Lawrence beginning and in recognizing where he is today, it tells us that America, that Hollywood has changed. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Lonnie. Thank you. Let's take a look from 1975. Here is Cornbread, Earl, and Me. Back with me to discuss Cornbread, Earl, and Me is Dr. Lonnie Bunch, secretary of the Smithsonian Institution. So this is a film that really kind of shifts tone and shifts gears when we have this tragic killing of Cornbread, his nickname, uh, the basketball hopeful of the neighborhood. He's gonna be the first person to go to college in this community. 
Could you talk a bit about just the way that the film gets into that, that aspect of the story? One of the most powerful things about the film is watching Cornbread with his mother and father, to watch them bounce the basketball, throw around to each other. The sense of family was really captured very well. And then the hope, not just of the family, but the hope of the entire community, whether it's the shopkeeper saying, you know, he's going to be the first one in our community to go to college and have a career that's legal. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and that you really see Lawrence Fishburne and the kids all looking up to him. Um, and so I think that for me, this is really about hope, but it's also about hard work. Mm -hmm. I mean, the sense that you see him practicing every day and you see him recognizing like in hoop dreams, you're recognizing that if he's successful, his family will do better. Um, and so he has that pressure, but there's almost a joy um, that he has that playing basketball for the character allows him to be free of that pressure. Mm. And then the reality of life in a city changes everything. That's right, yes. I mean, you get the sense he's doing what he was born to do. It's his destiny. And so when that gets cut short, it feels so tragic. I mean, we've had other films that black filmmakers have made since that talk about police brutality, mm -hmm. accidental or mm -hmm. intentional killings of black men. There are moments in this film that really reminded me of Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing, for example, after the murder of Radio Rahim, the community is surrounding the police and you don't know what's going to happen. And also John Singleton's Boys in the Hood, where Ricky, played by Morris Chestnut, who is the football hopeful, he's going to go to college, the first in his community to go, and then he's gunned down, shot in the back. It's a very similar staging of this. Why do you think that filmmakers continue to go back again and again to these kinds of moments? In many ways, because these moments happen time and time again. And the notion that a promise is snatched away, um, sometimes by racism, sometimes by intentionality, sometimes by accident, like in this particular film. But I think regardless of the cause, you see the loss. You see a community's hope extinguished. You see someone who could help transform a society not having that chance because he tended to be black and in the wrong place at the wrong time. And so I think that this movie becomes really something that illuminates so much. On the one hand, it is the sense of loss, but it's also the sense of who has the courage to speak truth to power? Who has the courage to say at a time when the police dominate everything? Who has the courage to actually say what was done to this young man was wrong and that the police need to take responsibility, even if it was an accident? And I think that is really a, a sort of powerful part of this, whether it's how the community responds initially by attacking the police, um, venting their anger and their fears, or whether it is when suddenly people who could speak don't speak mm -hmm. because they're afraid of um, the ramifications. Mm. In some ways, it's much like many of the films we saw about Mississippi, yes. the fear. And for people who then can break that fear, they can transform a nation. Yes. And that's what happens, I think, in this film as well. Mm. Yeah, you're asking who will have the courage. The person who has the courage is Wilford, the character played by the very young Lawrence Fishburne, who despite the fact that elders in the community don't speak up, he can't suppress this truth, even though he knows that it could be harmful. He's told by some of the community members that you're getting us all in trouble by talking about this, but, but what, he knows he has to do it. And what's so powerful is his mother, Rosalind Cash, who basically says, this is your moment. Are you gonna stand up and be a man? And I think that in some ways, people miss how powerful that is, that mother-son relationship, but recognizing that you're willing to risk everything to tell the truth to do the